Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Commerce Next co-founder Veronica Sansa, and I want to thank you for joining us today. For those that are new, Commerce Next is a community event series and conference for marketers at retail and direct-to-consumer brands. And on behalf of my fellow co-founders, Scott Silverman and Alan Dick, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Our topic is Treat Any Day Like Black Friday, How Composable Commerce Unwraps Your New Normal. So let's talk about holiday for just one sec. As you prepared for this year's peak, you probably added capacity, ensured IT and your vendors are ready, and maybe you established a code freeze. Well, today's webinar is gonna demonstrate that this approach is a relic of the past and that modern commerce infrastructure can solve a lot of these challenges. We are really lucky. We have a great group of speakers joining us today. They have been entrenched in the world of composable commerce, and we're excited to share their experience. But before we dig in, I want to walk through just a few thank yous and announcements. So first, I want to thank Commerce Tools. Um, they have truly been thought leaders when it comes to composable commerce, and it's been great to partner with them on this webinar. I also want to thank our speakers, Dylan Vallade. He's the head of global e-commerce technology at Puma and an ambassador for the Mock Alliance. Deepa Shaker, she's the director of digital marketing technologies at Logitech. Kelly Gaicht, he's the chief strategy officer at Commerce Tools, and AP, who is principal at Deloitte Digital. We will be sending our speakers thank you gifts via our gifting partner, GiftNow, as a small token of our appreciation. Now, this week, we are continuing with our drive to grow our social following on Instagram. So for the first five people that follow us on Instagram, you will get a free gift via our gifting partner, Gift Now. You can just find us on Instagram. We're at Commerce Next, or Maeve will actually be posting the link in the chat. Our next webinar is in two weeks. It's Wednesday, November 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And the topic is winning customer loyalty beyond holiday sales. So I'll be hosting this one again with speakers from Case Spade, Komodo Group, and Minted. So the theme of this webinar is basically tied to, you know, everyone's pushing hard right now to acquire customers for the holiday. And what we wanted to talk about in two weeks is what you can do to retain those shoppers after the holidays end. So if you're interested in joining us, there's a link in the chat, or you can learn more at commercenext.com. Our most recent podcast dropped, I think it was last week, um, and it features Carolyn Pollock. She's a CMO of Tailored Brands. The topic is staying true to your brand uh, and modern marketing strategies. And this is a really interesting episode. Carolyn talks about how Tailored Brand lost their North Star during the pandemic with casual wear, but recently refocused on helping men love the way they look and feel for the most important moments. It's a great episode. You can check it out on our website, commercenext.com, or wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. And then if you haven't had a chance to check out our most recent research report, we're including it in the handouts here. It's called From Digital Sales Cheer to Consumer Spending Fear, and it offers an outlook for holiday 2022 based on our recent retailer survey. Um, I want to thank everyone who took the survey and you know, if you download the report, you can see some of the predictions on sales growth, margins, promotions, and marketing strategy. Finally, um, it's our last week for our Refer a Friend contest. Um, we know that what makes Commerce Next unique are the retailers and brands that join our events. And if you have a friend that would benefit from our in-person or our virtual events, invite them to join our community. Um, they'll get invited to cool things. You'll have an opportunity to win a Theragun Mini or two Apple AirTags. So um, make sure you refer your friends right away. And then if you have missed any of our past events, um, I just wanted to remind you that we have everything available for replay on YouTube. It includes our past webinars, our summit sessions. There's a mix of strategic content and how-tos. And if you go to youtube.com slash commerce next and follow, you'll get notified whenever new videos are up on the channel. So just showing you where everything um, is on the screen. So first of all, sorry, um, this webinar is recorded. 
We usually have it up by the next day, so it'll be available tomorrow. Um, so don't worry if you miss anything, you will be able to replay it um, shortly. It's, it'll be available right away. And in terms of where everything is, so the as you probably have already seen, <laughs> the main panel for inter interactivity is on the right. It has the chat, Q&A, polls, and handouts. Now, we want you to use the chat to engage with other attendees, give the speakers high fives. But if you have a question, we really encourage you to use the Q&A tab. Um, the Q&A tab has some additional functionality. You just click on the tab, enter your question on the bottom, and then you can upvote your question. And the benefit of that is we then know which questions are important so that we can pose them to our speakers. And even if you don't have a question, it's good to check in there and upvote other people's questions so we, we know to ask them, especially on a topic like this. Um, and then the handouts is the, is the last tab to the right. Um, there you'll be able to download the slides from today. There's a white paper from Commerce Tools that's also available. And of course, our holiday research report is there. And if you are watching this um, in replay, that link to those handouts is at the bottom of your player. So our agenda for today, we, we start with a presentation, um, Treat Any Day Like Black Friday by Kelly Gage, Chief Strategy Officer of Commerce Tools. Then we have audience polls and then a panel discussion with Puma, Logitech, and Deloitte Digital. So with that, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Kelly to the stage. Just a little bit of background on me. Um, I started my career with ATG back in the early 2000s. And back in those days, we actually spent a lot of time, in many cases, two, three, four months preparing for Black Friday and Cyber Monday. It was a really big deal. And we'd go get hardware and pull it off the loading dock and get a rack stacked and cabled. And we'd have to double or triple our, uh, our servers. It was a whole big thing. Um, and my last couple of years at ATG, I was the lead architect for uh, Walmart. And then I went to Oracle, and this was right when public cloud was starting to become a thing. And I was a product manager in their early cloud group. And that's where I married e-commerce and cloud. I wrote e-commerce in the cloud, and I really loved that intersection of commerce and cloud. And I thought, wow, cloud has the ability to completely change how we do e-commerce. And my last year at Oracle, I was responsible for microservices, which again, that was another epiphany moment for me. And I thought there's got to be somebody out there doing commerce, cloud, and microservices. And I found uh, Commerce Tools a little over six years ago. Um, been there as a chief product officer, recently moved into chief strategy role, and I uh, wrote three more books, um, co-founded and ran the Mock Alliance and generally been having a great time. It's a fantastic time to be uh, changing e-commerce out there. And um, I'm thankful that I've been able to, to be a, a player in this space and, and really help drive the industry forward. All right, um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and actually get started. So e-commerce has always been spiky, traffic has. And if you look at the traffic for like uh, Kohl's.com, a retailer, I actually included that in my first book. Um, you know, their steady state traffic is about 3% of holiday peak. And there are two types of, uh, of, of spikes, right? You see planned traffic, and that's the case of a Black Friday. Um, email is another you know, great example there. If you're blasting out a 50% off coupon to every one of your, your customers, you know, clearly you're going to have a giant spike in traffic after that. Um, and unplanned is an example where you've got social media, you know, maybe somebody with 200 million Instagram followers mm -hmm. posts a link. Um, it could be a misprice and, and I'll get into this more in a second, but you know, there are those two basic ways of, uh, you know, two different types of, of spikes and you have to be prepared for them. Um, let's go through plan spikes. Um, we've got uh, black Friday, cyber Monday. Again, we've got planned promotions, um, We've got uh, holidays of various types, you know, lots of different things, um, primarily through marketing and the calendar will drive traffic. And that's great. We expect to see that. That means marketing is working. That means, you know, the, the world is functioning that we have a Black Friday, Cyber Monday or Cyber Week as it's now being called. But, you know, clearly there are seasonal spikes in traffic, you know, for a lot of the retailers back to school season is a big spike. So those are planned and that all makes perfect sense. Um, and then there are unplanned spikes. So you've got social media influencers again, 
um, we had a, a customer of ours that accidentally mispriced their jeans. And instead of 10% off, it, they did 90% off. It was a math error. And what happens when you get a 90% off <laughs> deal with a coupon code um, that flies around the internet at literally light speed and they got completely swamped with traffic. And thankfully we didn't crash. Um, everything stayed up on our side, but created a lot of issues for them when they, <laughs> they had to sell those jeans at a big loss. Um, you see the same thing with airline fares, for example. You see missed prices where you know, they'll miss a decimal point or something like that. And all of a sudden, you know, everybody in the world is trying to fly from, uh, you know, Los Angeles to Fiji for uh, $200. And you see that pretty regularly. And historically, we only really looked at the planned um, spikes in traffic. So we had code freezes. And I, I think many organizations still do this. Um, we at Commerce Tools do not code freeze anymore for uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, for holiday spikes, anything of that sort. But basically for two, three, four months out of the year, many retailers and organizations freeze their code. Um, they also add a lot of hardware. So they're adding lots and lots of capacity up front, which mostly sits completely unused and idle. They're adding 24-7 coverage. Um, and I've spent many nights of my life, some of the best nights of my life in those uh, those conference rooms um, waiting for uh, giant spikes in traffic and then handling things. You know, if there was a disc that was about to get full, you know, you'd, you'd go empty it, right? Or move it. So you wouldn't run into that issue. If you needed to restart a JVM, you, you did that. So there were teams of folks on standby to do 24-7 coverage um, for these things. Um, another is uh, switching to vendors that are much more asynchronous in instead of synchronous. Not everything has to be loaded synchronously all the time. So there's a lot of caching that has to be done, um, things like that. And then finally, this is still an issue out there today. Um, there are a lot of tech organizations that tell their marketing team, do not send large volumes of customers because we can't handle it. And you see that a lot around, again, Black Friday, right? So if marketing is, is running some promotions, that's great. But in many cases, they'll say, let's not have our uh, our paid influencers, for example, our social media celebrities. Let's not then have let's not have them drive traffic at the same moment because they just can't handle it. So I, I think, um, you know, historically um, and in many cases today, you see organizations really locking things down and really overtly preparing. Right. And everything, you know, there are meetings and war rooms and, you know, there's a whole um protocol for handling planned spikes in traffic. And the challenge today, though, is, is there are just so many unplanned spikes. And now with cloud, you don't necessarily need to treat, um, you know, everything can be unplanned. You can dramatically scale um, on your own, right, without any human involvement whatsoever. Um, but, you know, what happens if uh, Rihanna or somebody, I think that's Rihanna, I, I need to catch up on my uh, on, on who these people are. But um, <laughs> I'm sure she has a lot of Instagram followers. If, if she posts a link to one of your products or something, you know, that's a dramatic quick spike in traffic. And that's something many organizations wouldn't be able to to handle. So you have to remember that really, truly any day, any moment could be your next Black Friday. And you could go from, you know, 200 requests per second, which might be your baseline to 2 million requests per second. And that spike might only last for 30 seconds or a minute due to some celebrity or misprice or who knows what it could be, but you need to be able to handle that. And we are starting to see our customers and we ourselves at Commerce Tools have done this for years now. We release all the time and we have really robust um, technology and procedures in place to do validation testing. We roll out the changes incrementally so we don't, you know, if there is a, something that, that breaks catastrophically, um, you know, we, we're not impacting all of our customers at the same time. So we'll do very gradual canary releases. Um, we have very good control over our source code and custody of the source code. And we can ensure that we have um, uh, integrity of, of our source code being deployed. Um, we also use SaaS to autoscale. Um, in, in our case, we use Kubernetes for everything in the back end. And that's the whole point of these solutions is, is they auto scale. 
right? That's the whole value of them. And there are lots of products out there, whether it's, it's functions as a service, and that's really the whole value of cloud is everything just magically auto scales for you. Uh, monitoring and support should always be done 24 seven. And, you know, generally as an industry, we should make sure that we're on top of these things. Um, also select vendors that are proven at scale you know, architect better, use things like command query response segregation so that you're separating your reads from your writes and you can scale each of them independently. Um, and your load generally shouldn't matter, right? Whatever your baseline is, if you multiply that by one or two orders of magnitude, you know, maybe you see an increase in response times for a second or two as the system scales. But generally speaking, we as an industry are now mature enough and the products are now mature enough and the processes are now mature enough that we shouldn't have this arbitrary thing anymore called uh, holiday or whatever it happens to be. And you are all in lockdown mode waiting for traffic to hit because really any moment could be that. So you have to be prepared for it. And this is really the new normal. This is the standard today. And if you're building an application from scratch in 2022, it by definition auto scales. It by definition is stateless. You're almost by definition using mock-based technologies, which stands for microservices, API, cloud native, and headless. This is just the world that we live in today. A um, couple of quick slides on us. Um, we offer a mock-based uh, commerce solution. So we're the leader in Gartner and Forrester and IDC. And we have a lot of big brands as our as our customers, both B2C, which I've um, highlighted here, but also B2B. And when we have somebody listed here, we don't just do, you know, some small regional microsite or something. These are the flagship.coms. So we're very proud to have these uh, industry leading organizations. And we're very much a product first company. And I think that's what's helped us um, adopt this approach where, you know, we're very much oriented around scalability, doing things the right way. Um, you know, we have a lot of our, our competitors out there that are very, very uh, sales driven, very marketing driven, very, you know, they're going out and selling and marketing a product that doesn't really exist. And we toiled for years and years and years in silence building a good product. And then we scaled it out. So I think being product first and ruthlessly product first is really the right way to build a, a product and the right way to build a company. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Veronica. Thank you all. And um, I look forward to the rest of the webinar. Awesome. Thank you for teeing that up, Kelly. Really appreciate it. Um, so now we get to do audience polls. Yay. Um, all right, our first question. Oh, and before I go into the polls, just reminding everyone that when the polls open and you want to see the results, you just go to polls closed and you'll see the results right there. Um, so our first question is, do you believe your current e-commerce platform could support an unexpected traffic spike? And the options are yes, no, and not sure. Um, I'm just going to quickly repeat that question. Do you believe your current e-commerce platforms could support an unexpected traffic spike? So like the example is, you know, Rihanna promoting your product um, on Instagram unexpectedly. So let's see what you guys had to say on this. This is great. So half of you think that your current e-commerce platform can support an unexpected traffic spike. 20% say no and 30% are unsure. So there's definitely um, some room for improvement there. The next question is relating to code freeze, code freeze being when um, you, you're not adding any features or code to the e-commerce site. So the question is, when do you go into code freeze for the holidays? The options are before October 15th. So some of you might be in code freeze already between October 15th and October 31st, November 1st to December 15th, or sorry, November 1st to November 15th, or never, we don't go into code freeze. Interesting. Okay. We have some people who are already in code freeze. Um, the bulk of you go into code freeze November 1st through November 15th. And there's some people, about 33%, who'd never go into code freeze. So we're going to talk about that opportunity definitely as part of this webinar panel discussion. And then our last poll question is actually related to our webinar next week, Winning Customer Loyalty Beyond Holiday Sales. Or, sorry, not next week. It's on November 9th. 
And that question is, um, using your best estimate, what percent of your holiday shoppers purchase again within the next year? So this is people who buy during the holidays, what percent of them will actually buy in the year to come afterwards? A is zero to 20%, B is 20 to 40, um, C is 40 to 60, D is 60 to 80, and E is 80 to 100. So the most popular answer is 60 to 80%, which is quite high in terms of repeat purchases. Um, but you still have, you know, 3% say zero to, or sorry, 18% say zero to 20. Um, and you have about 50% that only get 20 to 60% of their the B and C. So there's a lot of improvement there. And we'll talk about how you can do that in, in two weeks. So now I want to move into the panel discussion, bring everyone up on stage. Hello. Hi, everyone. All right. Um, so I think Kelly did an excellent job kind of teeing up the issue in the pres in his presentation. Um, I want to start by introducing the new folks who are on. And Dylan, um, Deepa, and AP, can you introduce yourselves and your role at your respective companies? And we'll start with Dylan and then kind of just do go around the screen. Is that okay? Perfect. I'm Dylan Valade, uh, head of technology for global e-commerce at Puma. I'm in the headquarters in Herzegonarik, Germany. And um, you know, happy to be here. Looking forward to this. Awesome. D AP, Hi. I have you next on the screen if you want to go. Thanks. Thanks, Veronica. I'm, my name is AP Apurva Pangam. I'm a principal at Deloitte Digital, and I lead, a work, lead our work in marketing, commerce, and customer experience, um, both across B2B and B2C, and a, and a very strong composable evangelist. Awesome. Deepa. Hi, I'm Deepa. I head the web and e-commerce technology division at Logitech, uh, responsible for uh, a large team of developers who uh, build and maintain our dot-com sites for all our brands. Awesome. Um, and we're really lucky to have this group because I think you'll see when, when we go into the questions that you know Deepa and Dylan have a different approach and AP kind of sees people's composable commerce approach across a wide variety of companies. So we'll get a chance to touch on that. But before we dig into the questions, um, I wanted to, to pose a question to Kelly. And we talked about this a little bit before the call. Um, I want to start by aligning on definitions, because I think a lot of times the terms composable commerce and headless commerce are used interchangeably, but they're actually different. And I, I, I feel like we should just tee up what those differences are for the audience, Kelly. I had a frustrated business uh, <laughs> executive call our space a cult because of our use of uh, terminology that only we seem to understand. <laughs> so we you have to help us here. <laughs> we don't do ourselves a, dis a favor here. Um, so there are a couple elements to this. Um, so we, as vendors, are offering up our data and functionality through APIs. And that collection of APIs from a vendor standpoint is headless, right? We're offering our product without a head, but that's very much a vendor centric term, which confusing we, we created. <laughs> Composable is what Gartner is calling more the consumption side of this. And they've done a great job of really defining that term, doing a lot of thought leadership around it. But Composable is, you know, I am a brand or retailer right? I, I need to compose an experience using def, different best of breed APIs. And those APIs are typically served from somebody who's natively headless. But it's, it's a view, right? It's a headless is a vendor term, whereas composable is more of, I want to compose an experience for my end shoppers using these best of breed APIs. And functionally, it's a little, as I understood it, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it's a little bit different, whereas you can have a headless experience where the UI is is separated from the back end, but the back end is still monolithic. But correct. with composable commerce, it's more modular on the back end. That's, that's how I understood the difference. Is that fair? Correct. And Gartner uses yet another confusing term called packaged <laughs> business capabilities, which roughly map back to individual microservices. And the whole point of composability is you can use granular pieces of functionality from different vendors. So we at Commerce Tools, we have a big library of these 300 APIs. You know, maybe you want to start with just a shopping cart, right? Whereas a lot of the legacy solutions also do now have headless support, 
but you have to use the entire platform top to bottom. And I think that's the key with composability is being able to pick and choose a lot of great vendors out there, but you know, you might not necessarily want to use all their, their pieces, you know, maybe you want to use a third party promotion engine, right? And that's fine. We, we encourage that or a third party search or whatever it happens to be. But I think that era of vendors just offering up everything, whether it's headless or not, and then expecting the customers to use the entire thing. I think that's really over. It's now more of you got to win every single customer over with every single API you sell. And if your API isn't meeting their needs or for whatever reason, the customer is going to go pick a different vendor, different API, and they're going to compose using, think of them almost as Lego blocks, you know? Perfect. Awesome. Thank you for helping us level set and, and define here. Um, all right. So my first question, just for a little bit more context, um, is directed towards Dylan and Deepa. And I wanted you guys to maybe share with the audience where you are in your composable commerce journey. That is how much of your e-commerce infrastructure is modular at this point. And Dylan, maybe you can go first here. Sure. Uh, we've been on this path now for a long time at Puma. Uh, so I started six years ago. And at that time, we actually had the war room for when Rihanna Fenty shoe would launch, and we had to wait for everything to potentially stay up or go down and solve it quickly. So right before I started, we had gotten our, our existing systems to basically meet that amount of demand. And what we've done since then is work on protecting ourselves from every system that would fall over. So where we looked at it wasn't we needed all of these things to be headless or composable. It was this is something that fails all the time. And it would be a payment partner or a fraud check or an inventory check. Okay, solve that one. And so over time, we built up something that could withstand a lot of traffic. So as we moved throughout the, the world, we've got 25 different markets that we're supporting. You've got a lot of differences. They have a different technology stack that run by different people. They have different partnerships. And we had to be able to be flexible for all of them. So that ended up being kind of the primary goal was how can we be flexible in a way that they bring their preferred partnerships, their better pricing that we can't get at a global level um, and make that possible. And that forced us into some of this thinking of how could you just plug in one little piece? Like you said, one little Lego here, one little Lego there, but with a kind of a standard playing surface. And that's more or less what we've been building. So I would say now we've got about 20% of our markets on our latest and greatest stack and about half or more already on what you would kind of say is that that middle headless where it's still one partner, one software top to bottom, but the database part, the, the reading and writing to the data is separated from the presentation, how it's going to look and feel. And once that's there, then the APIs at least exist so that as soon as you're ready, you can pop the top off, put a new app on, put a new website on, and, and everyone can get the, the latest marketing and technology. Awesome. That's really helpful. I love the Lego analogy because that that's a, that's a nice way of kind of, you can see how international markets have different needs and being able to kind of pull one piece out and plug in another could be very beneficial. Uh, Deepa. How, where are you in your in your journey? So unlike uh, Puma, we are still early in our e-commerce journey. Um, we uh, started late last year uh, with our discovery and uh, product selection. And uh, our uh, endeavor was uh, to own the first party customer data ourselves. Before that, we were on a, a third party commerce uh, system. Uh, updates were slow. We wanted to uh, take ownership of the system and uh, be more agile to be able to deploy uh, new features quickly. Uh, so uh, we started off the discovery and implementation early this year, 2022, and uh, we were um, live on one of our brands in July this year and uh, also live on our main brand, Logitech.com, um, early this month, October. Oh, congrats. Congrats. And, 
with regards to headless, we've actually taken a slightly hybrid approach. Uh, we're uh, more or less headless uh, with most of our pages, product pages, uh, product listing pages, uh, all of them being headless. But on the um, checkout and the card, cart and checkout experience, we're uh, still not gone headless, but we do um, understand that the benefits of headless uh, far outweigh uh, the uh, benefits of the current system we have and really get to a uh, full headless solution soon. Awesome. And actually, there's a, there's already a question coming from the audience. Um, it's from Christina. Um, she asked, um, is an example of Shopify, they have a fr they have front end uses their apps, but as a platform, you have to use their back end. And I think she's asking if Shopify would be an example of headless versus composable. I don't know if Kelly or AP, you want to take that. Well, I might be biased here, but um, <laughs> AP, um, do you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, look, it's it's the platform at the end of the day. You know, I, I don't want to necessarily talk about one technology or the other, but again, I want to go back to the the fact that it's about how you're using it. It's not just if whatever technology you're using, using Shopify, commerce tools, etc. If you're using that as the best in class piece of everything else that's being built. Um, and it's not just being used as a quote unquote monolithic solution. Uh, you're using the best of each of them. That's that's what's really driving that composability, that uh, redundancy and that flexibility versus if you're expecting everything to go just to one solution, you're essentially going back to just headless. Awesome. Kelly's nodding, so I think he approves of your. <laughs> well, it, I think Shopify is a great example of of an organization that had a head built on and they're very um, they're very opinionated, right? Like their core business is selling. It's arming the rebels, as they say. It's folks who want to start selling some T-shirts online, you know, and they sell a couple thousand bucks a year worth of T-shirts. Fantastic for that use case. And the head was built on because it was an intrinsic part of that. As they've gone up market a little bit and started to compete a little bit more with Shopify Plus, they added APIs, which is fantastic but it's still not a terribly composable solution behind the scenes because it was still, it, it wasn't meant for that and the APIs were added after the fact. And we see this with a lot of vendors and it's fine, I get it. You know, if commerce tools had been built with a head on, we would not be able to be natively headless and composable. I get that. Um, it's primarily a function of when the organization was first built. As you you can't force every one of your customers to replatform, you know, when you do a major rewrite. So you're kind of frozen in time. Yep. Yep. Well, um, yeah, it's, and that's always a challenge with technology, right? It's almost like an arms, it's an arms race and the newer people have an advantage because they're starting from scratch and the older people have to keep the things that they initially built running while they enhance what they have. So it's, it's always a challenge from that perspective. Um, Christina also had a question about preparing for peak, and which is actually related to my next question. So we'll, let's kind of a, talk about that. Um, you know, Kelly, you teed it up in your presentation when you said a lot of times as people are getting ready for peak, they create war rooms, they do all these things. And I want to ask Dylan and Deepa now, you know, we've obviously come a long way. You know, what do they do to get their infrastructure and teams ready for this peak holiday season? And and Dylan, I'm going to start with you again, um, and then and then go to Deepa. Sure. The, the getting ready for peak season is is absolutely on everybody's mind. Um, coming into the the end of summer, that's usually what we're thinking about. Okay, we're going to come back. What are the last big initiatives that we're trying to complete so that we're not getting those things? turned on in November. That's the last thing that anybody wants. So I would say of, of all of the things that we're doing right now, I would put that at the, the top of the list that you're saying, this feature is not quite done. We're not comfortable adding this to the mix. We don't know how to troubleshoot it if it goes wrong. Those are the ones to quit and just wait till next year. But the idea of getting ready for the season and that traffic volume, as Kelly said earlier, it's, it's spiky you see that the traffic just goes through the roof and normally you don't get a chance to test all of your systems in production. There's people will talk about it. So let's do stress testing or some sort of testing, but the reality is you can't test every system that's involved all the time. And 
if you do, they'll actually go down. So you cause your own outage. So there's this kind of planning for peak and then um, imagining how big the peak could be. And what happened to us, we had Fenty with Rihanna that gave us peaks that we finally could overcome five years ago. Now we're getting, uh, we're able to handle that COVID holiday traffic, which happened for us in April and not in November. And that was uh, a whole different problem, but we actually solved it by just going to sleep. Nobody had to do anything. All of a sudden traffic was huge. And the last thing we remembered was, oh, well, you're supposed to get ready for this. Like we already were ready. This, this worked. And so you basically have the scars and with the scars then you're, you're prepared. So what happened again this year, we really launched this new composable headless setup. And basically what that meant is you have your, your commerce system running where you keep your shopping carts and your catalogs and your orders. And on top of that, you have a separate program application that's running that the consumers are actually visiting. That's your website, that's your app. And we had such popular shoes, our new basketball shoes that people were automating buying the product so that they could get it. And this hadn't really happened to Puma before. So we finally had something so cool and so hot that our all of our sites were just being slammed. This was across the whole globe. So for me as a technologist, it was interesting. I got to try every different tech stack that we had throughout the world and see which ones handled it best and worst. And what we saw was that with that composable structure, we were able to recover faster. We were able to insulate ourselves from the systems that couldn't handle the traffic. So it's not that everything went down all at the same time after you figured it out. It was more about preparing, knowing that these ones can't scale. Now, Kelly talked about with these APIs that were written in the past. These are applications that are 10 years old or more. They, they're not just gonna go install new servers and make this possible. It isn't possible. All we can do is insulate ourselves from that. We kind of talked about like if you started a company 10 years ago, you have the tech and the architecture from 10 years ago. The same thing for us as a brand, we rolled out these markets 10 years ago. We've essentially got the same problem. So every subsidiary is on a different stack, but we just have a different setup everywhere. What we have to learn is how can all of them exist peacefully? And when a piece fails, the whole thing doesn't fall over. Yeah. And that's more of our prep. So by the time November comes around, we're just dotting I's and crossing T's. There's not really a heavy prep to do. That's awesome. Almost so on another webinar, it was it was actually relating to marketing. They were saying, you know, the promotions that you run leading up to holiday kind of help you test into the promotions that are going to work for holiday. And almost in your case, like the product launches that you had leading up to holiday helped you test your infrastructure for holiday. Deepa, how is it different at Logitech? Uh, so at Logitech, again, uh, we are still early in the journey. And as uh, Dylan and Kelly mentioned that uh, there are certain portions of the stack which we still need to scale. And with the headless architecture, uh, we have heads uh, in front, uh, which uh, some of them need to be scaled. Uh, commerce infrastructure definitely scales uh, without having to do anything. And then there are the backend third-party systems, uh, and um, we have to evaluate each one of them and evaluate if they need to be scaled up and uh, reach out to those vendors accordingly. Uh, but uh, definitely the focus has changed uh, from um, focusing on uh, scalability to focusing on operations. So now uh, the technology team can actually take a back seat um, with auto scalability, uh, but uh, our operations teams uh, still work, right? Uh, doing their promotions, price updates, so on and so forth. So we focus a lot more on what kind of tools and uh, resources we can give them. Uh, so that they can be prepared much earlier. Um, we uh, try, uh, we've given uh, tools to be able to preview promotions, to be able to preview the site at a future date and time. And uh, 
uh, be able to schedule all your promotions, prize updates, and even content that um, is associated with the promotions. Uh, and the contents need content needs to be published across multiple head systems. Uh, so all of that uh, needs uh, to be scheduled. And uh, finally, you should have a good uh, QA automation and incident management uh, strategies so that uh, these promotions can be tested and the testing also can be scheduled and you get a notification that your promotions are working or they're not working. And if only if they're not working, you're coming back uh, into the office. So the focus becomes more of on the operation side than the technology. And actually related to that, and one of the other questions that Christine mentioned is, you know, if if folks actually throttle their high traffic moments anymore. And so she gave an example, I guess, before you would do like a VIP pre-sale. So those people get in early, so they're not coming at the same time as the main customers or you have like app only moments. Is that something you're doing, Deepa? Are any of you kind of seeing that in a, in a composable environment? Are people trying to throttle traffic at all? So we definitely uh, do set up some mechanisms in which uh, we try to avoid uh, bot traffic, especially for our flash sales. Uh, so we uh, do have firewalls obviously in place, but apart from that, uh, for especially for flash sales cases, we do set up a capture on the card checkout page where uh, you're allowing only uh, humans to be able to purchase there. And those are some deliberate decisions uh, that, so that uh, we're giving everyone a chance to be uh, able to uh, participate in the flash sale. Uh, yeah, uh, that's those are some of the techniques that we uh, take up. Got it. Um, AP or Kelly, do you what are you seeing kind of in the broader world of composable commerce? Are you seeing people create any kind of special moments to to kind of stage their traffic, or are they just letting it rip and everyone coming at once? Is there anything else that they're doing to prepare for peak that we didn't mention? It largely depends on product availability. I mean, if you've only got 10,000 units of a particular shoe or something, it has to be throttled. Well, I mean, if it's a hot item, it has to be throttled. <laughs> um, but other than that, not really. Um, there used to be this product, um, what was it, Akamai Shopper Prioritization. And in many cases, we'd throw that up over the front of every e-commerce that we were doing and you know, everybody would sit in a virtual waiting room, you know, like a line outside of a Walmart or something. But we don't really do that anymore. It's unnecessary at this point, unless you're limited on the stock of a single SKU. Yeah, makes yeah, sense. It's, it's taken away. It's taken away the technological part of it, Veronica, and it's it's really a more deliberate business decision, as Kelly said. It's you know, if, if you're if you're selling the, the hottest online gaming system, for example and you only have X number of units, that's that's what you're going to have to throttle. It's not about the um, the technology uh, crashing or falling anymore. Interesting. So it, it, the throttling, it sounds like in all the examples you gave, has to really do with making sure customers are buying the products and not you know people who are bots and, and trying to kind of arbitrage the situation. It's not about the traffic overall to the site, which is great. That's a big improvement. Um, so, you know, Deepa talked a little bit about how for Logitech, a lot of the um, team preparation is, is really tied to the ops team and being able to be, test the sales and making sure they get deployed correctly or test the promotions. Uh, anything else that like from a team perspective that has changed, like what are the best practices for monitoring uptime for being able to solve issues. I mean, you know, Dylan, even as you mentioned, issues come up sometimes unexpectedly. Like, what do you do for monitoring in those kinds of situations with an environment where, you know, there's so many different technologies involved? Well, if you look at our space, it's still relatively new, but we've matured a lot. So when I was getting my start, it was the early 2000s. And if you think about that, there was no cloud then, 
Uh, there were no REST APIs. They weren't really used. You know, we were all on desktops with glass monitors and you know Netscape Navigator, <laughs> right? And Internet Explorer. We had only as a society been online for a few years at that point in any meaningful way. And there was no such thing as a big startup ecosystem that just didn't exist. But now we have so many companies out there and cloud has lowered the barrier of, uh, of starting a startup. And you've got lots of companies out there doing one particular thing really, really well. And it's very much a meritocracy out there. And, you know, the best search engine or the best promotion engine or whatever it happens to be, they're going to win in their respective category. And that's great because more competition uh, leads to better stability, better scalability, better features, better everything. So it's very much an open market and it's great to see all these folks competing. And that's all to the benefit of organizations running these products. Yep. And so how do you, so I guess, then how do you monitor all of that? Dylan's got his hand up there. So the, the flip side of Kelly producing software is that now we have 10 times more things to try to troubleshoot and stitch together and monitor. So what, um, to more directly answer the question, what do we do? You need to have a, actually a, a not just one service, but many that are able to monitor these different areas so that you have something looking specifically at iOS and Android apps and something specifically looking at whatever part you've got to watch out for, because you don't have to look at all of it, but at the same time, you need to know what happened in all of it so that when there is a failure, it looks through every layer of that request, that user session, to figure out when did it go wrong? And then to find out, was that just a, the one time a year or is this a pattern? So then we can go back and look at that same scenario and see actually there is a pattern here. It's really small, but it's so frustrating as a customer. And those are the ones that we're trying to find. So then we have a whole separate machine learning anomaly detection that can look back in the past when we learned something new and see what was the pattern so on the one side, it's looking back in time, has this been going on and we just didn't know. And I can say the one thing that's a good outcome of this headless journey is that there's so many problems that have been going on forever. Nobody was aware of until you started looking and then like, oh, you're the problem. Or they like, actually, this problem has been here forever. Nobody knew about it. I'm glad we fixed it. I would say maybe, maybe half of the issues we've started, I don't know the number for sure, but I'd say about half are actually always have been there. Nobody ever knew about it. So the company is absolutely stronger just by entertaining this. But then now we're looking at how quickly can we identify a problem that's live in production? And that's where it gets harder because there's so much noise. Like, is is the payment service actually down or was this person just declined yeah. as fraud? That's the part that we spend more of the time doing. What really happened in this particular checkout? Yep, yep, super helpful. And actually, um, Lori Rogers just posted um, posted a question, which was very similar to what I was going to ask AP. So I'm going to direct this to you, AP, if you don't mind. She said, if you add more third party features in a headless environment, do you need different or new IT resources to ensure they're all working together? And if so, what are some of the key skills that are important for this? Yeah, I, you know, even to thanks for the question. And, and even to what Dylan was saying earlier, and, and the way he, he, he brought that team together, I also want to make sure that we're thinking about composable, not just in terms of the technology, but also we all compose teams. We all bring the best in class of people together for our own teams. And I, I want to make that make sure that thinking is also not just a technology composability, but also really building that right team together. Now, you know, we do, we do that for several reasons. We do that for redundancy. Um, just like you're doing it for on the technology side, you're doing it even from people's side. I've been on many a holiday on-call situations uh, throughout my years, um, and and it's it's when you're the only person doing that, it's it's a big challenge. Um, then you, you having that redundancy, having the right uh, sort of composed team across these various solutions, it might take a moment to find the problem, but it might actually solve the problem faster. You know, back to Dylan's point, it'll solve the problem faster because now you've exactly pinpointed what went wrong rather than trying out and testing out various scenarios. And so when you talk about that team composability, 
you're really looking for, uh, you can either flex your current IT resources to learn some of those new technologies because um, versus just specializing in one. So having that flexibility with your resources um, and also, you know, building the right team based on the various types of uh, technologies and pieces that you have. So thinking about that as, as business services that you're providing to the business, you know, Deepa, you mentioned how you are creating that experience for your business customer. Essentially, you're being you're composing the right experience in a way to your business as well to make sure that they are, you know, they have the right tools and the technologies to, to run their business perfectly. That's awesome. That's a great way of thinking about it. And, and um, I love that the answer is not necessarily to hire a bunch of specialists, but also to help kind of retrain the existing team. So they start to learn and adapt and kind of understand more of, of, of what a modern technology stack would, would look like. Um, Let's talk about code freezes because I think that is a, is a topic. I mean, one of the big pain points and still a huge percent of the industry has code freezes. Um, I, you know, Dylan, you, 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 I know when we talked in the prep call, you said we don't really have code freezes, but you also talked about the fact that if, if like completely new features, maybe you're not launching. Talk about how you look at holidays and what features you're going to launch and what features you won't launch during peak periods. Sure. My opinion is that you want to enter new markets all the time. If you have something ready to put into a new market where you're not selling, do that. If everyone's sharing the same technologies, that means you're actually going to be releasing a new market into a service that another country is already relying on. So even though it's not for a market that's already live, it's actually going to be happening anyway. So that's one thing where I never would want to stop. If there's an opportunity to get live before the end of the fourth quarter, let's do it. If you have a new feature, some of them we've been working on for six months. And if you can get it out before a holiday, when you get most of your business, get it out. Otherwise you've lost the opportunity to benefit from it. And then if it fails, now we know how to fix it. We go back to the previous version of the code. We can do that in five minutes and then the problem's over. So that, that like, don't do it the second before <laughs> you're launching the big email campaign or whatever social post, but you could do it the day before. And the other thing was we stop stop releasing at night. Everything's done during business hours and things like that just make life easier. So when we talk about the teams, we were retraining our people so that mental health is more important, a lot more one-on-ones, including with the partners. How do we protect the people? Some of this work is hard. Like you can't protect everybody but you can protect a lot more than we had done in the past. And you can give the voice to the technology teams that are the ones essentially on the hook for all of this working. And marketing can do the work and make the traffic, but at the end of the day, they can't help when this stuff goes wrong. So really giving the, the development team a chance to speak up and say, we've had enough, or please do it this way. And then us listening to them and changing so that their lives are better too. Yeah, I love that during the day because it's easier to roll back and respond to issues as opposed to you do things overnight and then there's a problem you have to wake someone up to <laughs> do an emergency patch or a rollback. Um, Kelly, um, Anita Temple had a question for you. She said that one of the Commerce Tools customers recently shared that they could release features during Black Friday. Is that solely possible because of the composable architecture and are there risks involved? I think it's more a function of the maturity of the organization doing the releases and the technology and procedures in place that are required to do rollbacks. And something we've done, for example, is um, we have visual uh, automation uh, to test for regressions. So all of our business user tooling, you know, we have a lot of it. We take a snapshot of it. Think of it as basically like a real, you know, snapshot, like a screen capture. And then we'll do a visual diff between the before and the after just to make sure we didn't break anything. <laughs> um, or, you know, APIs, if everything is API based, it becomes really easy to test each API with a very gigantic suite of tests. So when you combine all of that testing and then you have a canary release approach where you're releasing to 1% of your traffic and you look at error rate, you know, if you automate it all properly and know what you're doing, you can release any time. I don't, I would like to think that, you know, mock-based technology helps with that, but I think it's more of a correlation in that folks using newer technologies are also the ones a little bit more competent 
So I, I don't know if there's causation there, but I'd like to believe there is. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I like that answer. It's like, it's not like Composable is the answer to anything, everything. It's, it's a combination of having the right tools, having the right processes, and having the right people in place that all of those things have to really be together to be able to kind of open up that flexibility. And yep. I can't believe we're running out of time. It's like this webinar has gone so fast. Um, there's one question I want to um, I want to ask Deepa, and and I because I, I really felt like this was kind of a unique thing to Composable that's really worth covering. Um, you know, obviously holiday is is incredibly important time for conversions and sales, and you know one of the benefits of a headless infrastructure, whether it's Composable or just headless, is that unlimited creativity involved in in the pages that you you create talk about um the process like at logitech deeper for a second like how are you like does your team are they able to change anything talk about how, what it looks like how are you optimizing your e-commerce pages for peak so uh logitech is um and has been a design-led organization uh, right from the ceo to uh, literally every touch point with our customers uh, so the same thing uh, follows on the website customer experience uh, is what drives what we put up on our web pages uh, many of our web pages are uh, very unique and uh, some of them are templated um, so the application, uh, our head application is built in such a way that it is uh, fully componentized. Uh, so we do have a um, set of macro components like the product list, recommended products, and so on and so forth. And we do have a lot of Lego block uh, components as well, uh, which are, uh, say, the add to cart CTA, a sale button. Uh, we have um, a video component, which are all small building Lego blocks. So our design team does have a full capability of uh, and uh, flexibility in customizing the app, uh, pages and building whatever type of pages they want. Uh, so uh, that's how we manage uh, creativity um, on the website. And uh, if you have seen our website, you will see um, creativity um, work uh, showing there. And anytime they're updating those pages, anytime they want, it doesn't, yeah. that's awesome. That's so great. So my last question is going to be a quick, I'm going to do a quick one. Um, any kind of last piece of advice for people? You have a lot of people asking questions. There's probably a lot of people on the fence. Um, I want to change the last question to any last words of wisdom or advice for people considering composable commerce. And I'll just kind of quickly go around Dylan, starting with you. I would lean into the people that you trust already. And if that's a, someone offering the software, start there. If it's an implementation partner or somebody else, start there. And then ask them, what would they recommend? You want to find a kind of a network of people that work well together and then hire those people. If you try to find people that don't actually work well together, you're going to end up with a mess. And that's for vendors as well as for internal people to internal team. Yeah, use what people are comfortable with. Um, start small, start very small and demonstrate incremental wins, build up your confidence and then continue to chip away. Great. AP? When you look at the, all the way from your lead to all the way to loyalty, when you're thinking about that journey, it's going to be an agile journey. It's not going to be a one-time thing uh, and it's going to take a while. Um, so, so be patient, but you're, you're building the best in class as well as you progress. Deepa? Uh, from my side, uh, headless is not an all or nothing solution. So um, again, uh, reiterating, start small if you are in doubt and show the values and then expand on that. Awesome. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Dylan, Deepa, AP Kelly. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you for sharing your experiences with the community. For those that are tuning in, Thank you so much for being here and for participating and for asking questions. We're back in two weeks on November 9th with our webinar on winning customer loyalty beyond holiday sales. Until then, have a great week. Thank you.